Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Candace Hoke. I'm here from, uh, actually, my center is located in Cleveland, the Center for uh, Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection of Cleveland State. Um, I'm happy to be with you with three fine litigators who are at the forefront of establishing new uh, legal rights for accountable, uh, verifiable, secure elections. Uh, they are working primarily in South Carolina and um, in Georgia right now, but the cases that they are fighting uh, will have impact for the entire nation. Um, you should be assured, first of all, that they know they are not speaking to lawyers. They plan to address us all as lay people who are um, highly uh, educated and concerned about election integrity, but not well versed in law and legal procedure. We will not be dealing much at all with the nuances of cases, but we do want to be able to talk with you about what's at stake. Um, this morning's speakers um, provided you with frank assessments of U.S. election insecurity, some of which you already knew, but they dug our hole uh, deeper. Uh, and they also addressed the federal government's initiatives to redress the deficiencies. You heard from Senator Wyden, from David Sanger, and from an excellent federal legislation panel, um, all of whom have proactive improvements that they hope to establish for um, improving our election security, particularly before 2020. I salute these efforts, as I'm sure you do, and I yearn for their success. But I think everyone in this room probably knows that smart, technically well-grounded federal legislation on cyber issues has been elusive, um, that especially where legislation is concerned on uh, the topic of elections and election security, um, we have met additional thorns. And as Susan Greenhall noted, the HOPE Act stands as a reminder of what has been proposed as common sense, um, easily implementable legislation that was simply dead on arrival. Um, we hope that that won't face uh, the current efforts, but quite frankly, it may um, be the outcome. Um, and somehow, when we are active and effective in achieving new appropriations for election technology improvements, the feds have not included mandatory security requirements. So what happens then is that the vendors continue to promote the same old types of equipment with similar kinds of vulnerabilities um, which they continue to market as secure and private and with military-grade encryption and other marketing terms that are not backed up by security science. Um, also, there's no security infrastructure requirements as a part of the legislation, and there is a lack of understanding at the states and localities as to what kinds of secure infrastructure, what, what security infrastructure means for running mission critical information systems that have certain kinds of vulnerabilities. And we in the cyber risk assessment field and cybersecurity management know that it is much more than having so-called secure machines. Um, but this information is not part of what's getting out. And it's not part of federal requirements and it's almost never a part of the federal legislation. And then moreover, to date, we still have no compliance structure for any type of mandatory regulations that we would include in any, uh, I would say, at the state or federal level, but particularly the federal level. Um, so it's not only a question of mandatory standards uh, for security, but we've got to have an ongoing assessment of how well they are being implemented. So. Even if the legislation is disappointing and the administrative and regulatory apparatus has not been moving very quickly, and I'll give you another example of some of the problems. Maybe Warren is still in the room, but Warren Stewart and I were in the executive office of the president, there he is, um, in spring of 2009, right after President Obama was uh, elected. And we were there to talk about um, urging that the election systems be part, uh, made part of critical infrastructure, 
and we were speaking, addressing uh, the vulnerabilities that pervaded the election system. And the response of the lawyers, because they had lawyers meet with us, uh, was that these vulnerabilities were remote and hypothetical. And we said, well, we can provide some evidence, and we gave them evidence of worms and malware and all already documented. And they still thought that because there were no provable hacks, there was nothing needed to be done. And this, unfortunately, is the way unf many lawyers still view um, vulnerabilities. They don't understand what we do in the cybersecurity world. Um, and then we have the problem as well uh, at the state and local levels of the procurement operations, often for, for voting systems, lacking technical knowledge, particularly computer security knowledge, so that those who are choosing, there's a disjunction, those who are assessing and choosing the new voting equipment lack the framework of security understandings for being able to assess the equipment accurately and, and judge its uh, adequacy for their particular jurisdictions. Um, so we end up with uh, perpetuation of the status quo at the, because of, in part, the legislative and administrative uh, dysfunctions that we've already seen. Um, in our 2016, and we found that we had, as Warren and I said, and, and, and you all had been saying, exploitable vulnerabilities. Um, that provoked more attention. But to pick up Senator Wyden's words this morning, it's a five-alarm fire. It has been a five-alarm fire for years, and yet we still have a snail's pace response. So. Because litigation tends to also be a snail's pace, but not always, as Max is going to tell you about, um, my Center for Election Integrity in Ohio swore off litigation when we wanted to reform Ohio post-2004. We wanted to be the educational and helping hand entity to help move the election uh, infrastructure forward. And um, that has some benefits, but it is still not enough. Um, our panel today is going to talk about the way they are using litigation to forward our election integrity goals. You don't have to think about um, the, the kind of, of ambulance chaser uh, ads that you've seen a lot. Uh, li all litigators are not about simply uh, <laughs> being on TV and, and uh, chasing uh, ambulances. Uh, our th <laughs> yes, Eddie, that's, that's another example. Um, we have uh, Litigation play, can play an important role, but it needs to be in the hands of highly informed, very strategically adept attorneys who also know how to ally with the technical experts that are needed for uh, a technologically intense area like ours. And I'm happy to report that the gentlemen that you see here today are examples of attorneys who do this. Now, we have others in the room who've often also done this effectively. Marion Schneider is one. Uh, Lowell Finley isn't here. He did as well. And uh, Eddie Hales as well. But this is a new generation of litigators that we can be excited about. Um, their bios are in the uh, materials, so I'm not going to spend a great deal of time there. Let me just mention that although the title of our panel is Election Integrity Litigation in the States, these gentlemen are litigating in the states and normally against the states, but in federal court, okay? In federal court. And they are seeking to establish federal constitutional rights, which will be, we hope, universal and beneficial. <laughs> so, um, so we're structuring it in terms of uh, those who are working on the voting systems and, and uh, 
EMS voting apparatus versus the voter registration systems and database uh, insecurities, because these have been different cases, although they, there is some overlap. And then at the end of our session, I'll also introduce you to yet another Georgia attorney who is also litigating in this space. So, um, so, so our panel is, um, first we have Larry Swartzall from Protect Democracy, who is primarily litigating in South Carolina right now, but uh, is involved in other actions as well. Bruce Brown, an Atlanta uh, litigator who is involved in several Atlanta litigate, or I should say federal litigations in Georgia. And Max Feldman from the Brennan Center, who is our voter registration database uh, expert and litigator. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Larry. And we are going to have each of our panelists stand here so you can easily see them, and then we'll sit down for a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Candace, and thanks to everyone involved in um, organizing this conference and for inviting us to participate in this discussion. Uh, I'm going to be quick because I have an ambulance to chase uh, as soon as this is done. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with a very, very small claim, uh, which is that I think a starting premise for everybody in this room is that uh, secure and reliable voting systems are a necessary condition of making our democracy work, right? Probably very little controversy on, on that. Um, and I actually think that that's a notion that would resonate with lots of people uh, beyond this room, people that, that don't have the uh, Olympian level of election-related nerdiness that is contained here, right? Um, and it's a pretty intuitive concept. Uh, the notion that participation in our democracy is not achieved merely by um, uh, putting a mark on a ballot or by touching a screen on a touchscreen terminal, uh, but by having your vote be accurately counted towards the outcome in an election. So this naturally raises the question, if a jurisdiction, for whatever reason, is failing to provide a sufficiently um, accurate and reliable voting system, should courts have something to say about that? Uh, in other words, if the goal of uh, securing elections goes beyond kind of best practices or sort of an aspirational thing to shoot for. But if it implicates the core rights, uh, the core rights of voters, can courts play a role in safeguarding those rights when jurisdictions fail to do so? Uh, so this question is not a new one. As Candace mentioned, uh, there are folks, there are folks in this room uh, who have waged earlier court battles on this set of questions, Marion Schneider and others. Um, uh, but this is one of these areas, uh, like many others in this space, where the landscape over the last couple of years has, has been shifting, right? The landscape has been shifting with respect to um, a broadening awareness of the vulnerabilities in our election systems and uh, an increasingly broad sense of the stakes involved in getting this right um, and so there may be some new opportunities right now to persuade courts that they should play a role in this area. So there could be many conceivable uh, fronts uh, on which litigation could be used as, as, a, as a strategy, uh, and some are going to be much more promising than others, right? So as far as I know, no one has asked any court to wade into the RLAs versus Bayesian audits grudge match. Um, and I don't think anyone should, right? Um, that's probably not the right set of questions to tee up for a court. Uh, I'm going to focus, for purposes of this discussion, as Candace suggested, on um, litigation relating to voting systems that are inadequately secure, and particularly uh, voting systems that are built around paperless DRE systems. Uh, I also want to suggest, though, that litigation in that particular area may have positive ripple effects uh, to a broader set of election security objectives. So the first question, you know, as I suggested before, is do voters have a legally enforceable right to cast their ballots on a reasonably secure voting system? Uh, where I work at Protect Democracy, we think the answer is yes. 
uh, in a lawsuit that we're litigating in South Carolina, um, we've argued that that right emerges out of longstanding principles that the Supreme Court uh, has articulated over the last several decades in several voting rights cases. So I'm not going to get into the doctrinal weeds of that argument, but uh, I'll just say a little bit about the core constitutional argument that we're, that we're advancing in the South Carolina litigation. And I think there will uh, probably be some of that that resonates with what Bruce talks about um, in some of the litigation he's involved in in Georgia. So since the you know, middle part of the 20th century, the Supreme Court has drawn on numerous constitutional provisions uh, to articulate a set of protections around uh, and enforce a set of protections around the right to vote. Uh, you know, one way this is often distilled is in the principle that, that may be familiar to most people in this room, the idea of one person, one vote, right? So that expresses an idea about equality. It also expresses an idea about the effectiveness of the vote, right? The idea is that this thing that is allocated equally, right, one vote, uh, has to have some meaning. Um, the cases that set out some of these underlying principles are not cases involving the security of election system. They're systems. They're different contexts, a different set of practices that um, the Supreme Court was considering. But the court has articulated some underlying principles that do apply to some of the challenges now revolving around election security, right? So just as one example, uh, in a case from in 1964 called Gray versus Sanders, the Supreme Court articulates the principle that the right to have one's vote counted has the same dignity as the right to put a ballot in a box, right? And so there's a set of principles like that that, that really resonate and apply to some of the questions that our current challenges around ensuring that elections are sufficiently uh, secure and accurate. So that kind of argument, the, that, the structure of that argument is essentially the raw material of litigation to help secure elections. Uh, it's at the center of our South Carolina lawsuit. In that litigation, we represent two South Carolina voters. Um, uh, one is a, uh, a lifelong Republican uh, and also a longtime activist on election security issues. Some of you uh, know and have worked with him, Frank Kindell. Um, Duncan has worked closely with Frank. Um, the other is a lifelong Democrat and former state senator named Phil Leventis. Um, and the argument we're making is that South Carolina's State Election Commission is failing to provide an election, a, a voting system that is sufficiently reliable to protect their right to cast an effective ballot. So in advancing that argument, we, uh, we, we ground the argument in a pretty granular story about the deficiencies pervading South Carolina's election system. Uh, and uh, in order to support the argument that in combination those deficiencies uh, uh, make that system unreasonably vulnerable, that it falls below a constitutional baseline. Um, and again, I, I'm not going to get so deep into the details, but, but broadly we draw on a few different strands. Most fundamentally, we highlight the vulnerabilities that are embedded in the voting system used in South Carolina. So throughout the, the, the South Carolina, uh, across the state, uses uh, the ESNS iVotronic system. Uh, so beyond some of the inherent vulnerabilities with using a paperless DRE system, there is a version of the iVotronic that has a VVPAT. The ones used in South Carolina do not, so it's a paperless DRE system. Uh, beyond those inherent deficiencies um, from an election security perspective, uh, as many of you know, the iVotronic system has been subject to uh, numerous uh, studies by, uh, by experts in uh, computing security and election security, uh, and it hasn't held up very well to that scrutiny. Uh, so most significantly, this was one of the systems that was examined in the Everest report uh, commissioned by the Secretary of State in Ohio and released in 2007. Uh, I don't know if people have had opportunity to return to the Everest report in recent years. It's a, it's a sobering read. Um, you shouldn't read it before, you know, it shouldn't be nightstand reading because uh, it's, it's a pretty sobering read. Um, we draw extensively from that report and other reports studying the iVotronic system to convey to the court that there are deficiencies in the architecture uh, as well as the firmware of that system that create 
numerous pathways to, um, to either to a hack or, also, or to mechanical failure. Um, but we, we especially highlight the, the vulnerabilities to uh, malicious attack. Those inherent vulnerabilities are exacerbated by uh, failings in network security related to state election systems, both at the state and county level. Um, one of our uh, clients in the case, Mr. Heindel, uh, in addition to being uh, a longtime activist on election security, is like a South Carolina FOIA warrior. Um, and he's been very successful in, in using South Carolina's public records law. Uh, and, and he has, through that process, um, uh, brought to the surface reports by DHS and by the South Carolina National Guard, uh, particularly in the run-up to the 2016 election, um, highlighting some of those deficiencies. So those reports are heavily redacted, but one thing that you can tell from even the redacted copies is that there are uh, there, there were a number of high level and critical level vulnerabilities uh, relating to the um, network security surrounding the election system, um, and you know finally we highlight the lack of the uh, of any sort of meaningful audit procedure. And this kind of follows from the fact that they're using a paperless DRE system. Uh, the state doesn't purport to have any meaningful audit provisions, and they couldn't because they don't have the equipment to support it. And so our core argument is that all of those considerations, particularly when viewed through the lens of the current threat environment, create a system that doesn't meet that constitutional baseline of providing a sufficiently reliable and accurate voting system for our clients to vote on. Uh, so the South Carolina litigation is ongoing. I should mention um, uh, it, it, it recently suffered a, a pretty significant setback. Um, so in January, the trial court ruled that our clients lack standing to, uh, to litigate the claims that I just described. Um, and the court's main view um, uh, was, was that the risk of the election system failing for, due to a, uh, an attack or any other reason was too speculative uh, for our clients to be able to litigate those cases. Um, so, so in some ways, uh, you know, an, an echo of the, uh, the feedback that Candace described even back in 2009. Um, we think the court was wrong about this. Um, uh, we think that the, um, the allegations we're making and under sort of the relevant legal standards are sufficient for this case to go forward. And so we're in the Court of Appeals now and continuing to press these claims. Uh, the setback is, is, I think, a good segue for what I think is maybe the main takeaway here, which is that litigation in this space presents um, significant opportunities but also has um, uh, significant challenges. Uh, so I'll just say quickly a little bit about the, some of the opportunities. The most obvious one is that it provides one potential route uh, to winning important reforms. Right? Courts are never going to be the primary decision makers about how to administer elections, and they shouldn't be. But when a jurisdiction, for whatever reason, is maintaining a deficient system, failing to provide a sufficiently uh, secure and reliable system, and it can't get its act together to improve that system on its own, courts may offer a path to, to change in those jurisdictions. Uh, more broadly, positive court outcomes may generate momentum for reform around the country. Partly that may be just through the kind of the drumbeat of, um, of, of, of reform efforts around the country and of discrete wins in particular cases. Partly it will be by framing a narrative about why these um, uh, vulnerabilities are so severe and why they implicate the core constitutional rights uh, relating to the right to vote. Uh, and partly by, you know, gently nudging policymakers and other jurisdictions who might prefer to drive towards change on their own <laughs> without facing the prospect of litigation uh, or having uh, changes imposed on them. Um, so there are also some challenges here, right? Most fundamentally, courts uh, don't want to be in the business of superintending elections. These cases don't ask them to do that, but some judges are naturally going to start from a, uh, a place of reluctance in taking these, these questions on. Uh, related to that, before you can get into a position of 
arguing about fancy constitutional principles or the nuts and bolts of any particular jurisdiction's voting system. You have to face a thicket of procedural, uh, sort of threshold procedural questions that any litigation will have to machete its way through, right? So these are questions like, do the plaintiffs have standing to raise their claims? Um, who are the right defendants to bring these kinds of cases against? Um, have the threats involved materialized such that the issues are sufficiently ripe for courts to resolve? Um, and time is not on our side, right? So um, litigation, the natural tendency of litigation is to move slowly. Um, there are sometimes some techniques to get litigation to move more quickly, but litigation tends to move slowly. Election cycles uh, keep coming one right after the other. As everyone knows, 2020 is around the corner and there's, there's sort of no rest for the weary uh, in terms of the election cycle. So, so the timing can be a challenge. So, you know, I've said a few times litigation is a tool and it's just one tool. And so as with any tool, it's good to keep in mind the old saying about uh, people with hammers seeing nothing but nails. Um, most of what needs to be done to make America's election systems as secure and reliable as they should be is not going to be achieved by courts. Uh, but building a system that is effective and secure implicates rights held by every American voter. And so courts should have something to say about that, and we should all be thinking about how to use courts as one tool in our collective toolbox. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bruce Brown, and I'm a lawyer from Atlanta. And uh, I have uh, three election cases in Georgia now, two in federal court, one actually in the Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, each of these cases, I represent the Coalition for Good Governance, uh, Marilyn Marx's organization, uh, and Ronnie uh, Martin, who's also here, and other Georgia voters. Um, I'm not going to get into too much into the legal intricacies of these cases because they can get very complex very quickly. Uh, and but if you have questions at that on those levels, we'll be happy to answer them. But just very briefly. Uh, the first case that I'd like to talk about is what we call the Martin case, named after Ronnie, who's here. And the Martin case is not, it challenges aspects of Georgia's absentee ballot procedures. It's not an a electronic case, but it's important to election electronics because uh, it's the alternative uh, for people who distrust the electronic machines. Uh, and it's also uh, becoming and because of that reason, it's becoming increasingly more popular in states like Georgia, where the machines, according to many uh, and according to us, uh, cannot be trusted. Um, and it's also important because some people have no other way to vote. They couldn't vote on the electronic machines uh, even if they wanted to. Uh, the problem in Georgia was that some counties were rejecting absentee ballots at a rate that was many times the rest of the state. Why? The rules are absolutely the same. They should be applied evenly no matter where you live. And your, your vote shouldn't be subject to which county you're in. In particular, Gwinnett County was the worst. It's a very, very big, uh, very fast-growing um, uh, metro Atlanta uh, county with a very uh, large number um, of, of minorities. And in Gwinnett County, there were five times uh, the rejection rate as other counties. So we sued, uh, focused on Gwinnett County, uh, and we actually won. This was one of the... the uh, cases that we can actually uh, score a victory. And I, I say we won. We, we won in substantial part. Uh, it's still ongoing, and we, and we anticipate complete victory. But what we challenged was the signature match requirements, which many of you are probably uh, familiar with, uh, for absentee ballot applications. And we also challenged the, the state, in particular Gwinnett County's, rejection of, of absentee ballots for immaterial reasons, for reasons that they could have taken the vote or not. And what we challenged was the attitude also was, why wouldn't you count those votes? Votes are precious. We keep on saying votes are precious. Then why don't you cast the votes that under state law you may? And so our, our continuing riff in the case is that if you may cast the vote, these absentee ballots, under state law, under federal constitutional law, you must. And so far that's been a winning argument. Um, the, the litigation may be overtaken a little bit by uh, legislation. Um, one better part of the current the, the, the uh, litigation is, I mean, the, the, the recent legislation uh, is that it's fixed and improved some of the ways that Georgia handles absentee ballots. 
<coughs> the, the second case that I'd like to talk about is what we call the, the curling case, which you may have heard about. This is in front of Judge Totenberg in Federal uh, District Court in Atlanta. Uh, the curling case was filed in 2017. It is a broad scale attack uh, on the DRE machine use in Georgia. Uh, and <coughs> the history of it is very complicated about how it started, but I'll start with uh, the fall of 2018 when the, the criticisms and the warnings to the state of Georgia got, got again to a fever pitch. Uh, and so right at that moment, uh, we filed to stop Georgia from using the electronic machines in the general election in 2018. Uh, we tried the case. Uh, we, we, we ultimately lost uh, on the injunction to have Georgia switch to paper ballots for that election, but there's many good things that, that came from that trial. The trial um, was just a day, I guess, maybe, a, was it a day, a day and a half, just a day, uh, and featured <clears throat> expert testimony uh, from, from Matt Bernard and from Alex Haldeman and Rich DeMello, all who were here, uh, and it was, it was outstanding. The, what the judge ruled was, and this is one of the challenges of litigation, was that although we were probably right in terms of the merits of our case, that in her estimation, that switching over to paper ballots that late in the process might cause more harm than good. And, and under federal law and most states' law, if your equitable relief may cause more harm than good, then you're not going to get it, even if your underlying claim is meritorious. But importantly, she uh, ruled and wrote extensively about how strong our claim was on the merits, in large part to the excellent work we got from our experts. And she said over and again how fundamentally vulnerable Georgia's current DRE uh, system was. Now, um, like I said, where, is, where are we now in that case? There's a several month um, gap because the state, uh, we, we prevailed before Judge uh, Totenberg on some preliminary uh, standing and, and jurisdictional issues. They took it up to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals affirmed Judge Totenberg's ruling on the procedural issues. So we're back down. And we're right now just, um, the case just came back down from the Court of Appeals. So right now we're going to go into discovery. Uh, and we hope to actually get discovery of the uh, DRE machines, something that's never happened before to actually look inside them, look at the programming, look at the GEMS database, and actually see what's going on and what's, what's driving these systems. Uh, that could be a fight. Uh, could be a fight with the vendors. Certainly will be a fight with the state. Uh, but we think with the, uh, with the momentum of Judge Tuttenberg's opinion and with other elections coming up, we're not, it's not just 2020. There's important elections between now and then. They're not as big as 2020, but those votes count too. And so we may... Um, we're going to insist that um, those elections, although not as big, be treated just like the big elections uh, accordingly. Uh, in addition, there's the, there's the new legislation that was passed or, or was passed by the Senate yesterday. I'm not going to get into that, but that could also enter into the litigation as well. Uh, because Judge Totenberg, in, in her order, um, made it very clear as to what she believed were the constitutional minimals. Uh, for, a, a, for a system. And some of these uh, observations are important for other reasons. I'll just, I'll just read them to you because they're very good. At this juncture, national and state commissioned research-based studies by cybersecurity, computer scientists, and election experts, many of them in this room, consistently indicate that an independent record and an elector's physical ballot is essential as a reliable audit confirmation tool. Essential. She then concludes her discussion by saying, if a new balloting system is to be launched in Georgia in an effective manner, it should address democracy's critical need for transparent, fair, accurate, and verifiable election processes that guarantee each citizen's fundamental right to cast an accountable vote. So uh, we think that that um, decision um, will be very important for other cases, a uh, good case for other people to cite. We hope to conclude it and to get permanent relief uh, as soon as we can. Uh, the third case that I'm working on is, a, is another interesting case. Um, it's actually in state court because it is an election contest. Uh, and this is what we call the lieutenant governor's case. 
the, um, and it was filed after the 2018 election. And what happened with uh, the race is that, as, as you all know, I'm not, a, I'm not an election, I don't, I am now, um, <laughs> State and Holiday Inn Express, I'm now an election lawyer, uh, but not my entire career. But as you all know, um, there is a predictable pattern of drop off from the top of the ticket to the bottom of the, to the, bottom of, of the ticket. And this established pattern, like in Georgia, if you voted in 2018, you voted for governor. Um, it was a very high profile election. And so the voter participation rate for governor was 99.9%, .9%, I think. Almost everybody voted uh, for governor. And then skip the lieutenant governor, I'll come back to that, okay? In the third ballot, it was also predictable. Third race, it was also predictable at about 98.5% for Secretary of State. And on down, you had a, this is, this is on all the ballots, electronic and paper. And all the way down, you had a very gentle and, and really minor uh, drop off to about 98%. However, in the Lieutenant Governor's race, which is the second ticket, a very important rate, uh, uh, position in Georgia, it went all the way down to 90%. 5.5%, uh, a 4.5% uh, drop-off, which is four times the historical average. Worse, that drop-off only appears on the electronic balloting. In the paper balloting, it's that same even slope. And there were 250,000 paper ballots, 200, a quarter of a million paper ballots. A robust, a robust number for our statisticians to use in evaluating how that could happen. Could it be that you just took the, that it, you know, that just happens by chance? The answer to that is no. We uh, obtained out of it evidence from, um, from Matt and from, from uh, Philip Stark. And what it is, what the, the probability of that happening as a matter of chance was one in 10,000. And so if, it, and I need to say that more carefully, is that if voters were inclined to vote or not vote for the le lieutenant governor, whether or not they were voting on paper or an electronic ballot, this will happen to this degree only one in 10,000 times. And so that was part of our, our lawsuit was just the statistics, that this, is, this aberration with the electronic voting is shown right here in the numbers. But we also had um, leading up to that, the, the background sort of, which I think is, is the most important part of these cases, uh, and this is, this is a key to standing, it's a key to a lot of the procedural issues, is, is you have to establish to the judge's satisfaction or to persuade the judge of the background vulnerabilities machines, just before you get to any election specifics, before you get to, to a, a undervote or to vote flipping or anything else. You have to convince the forum that these machines are, are suspect. And so when they get to a particular vulnerability, the answer is, well, yeah, of course. I mean, why not? Well, you told me that was going to happen. Everybody's saying it's going to happen. The Defense Department's saying it. The Senate's saying it. And here, here it happened. Uh, and so you, that's part of the and, – and, uh, and in the election case, what we argued was, number one, all of these machines nationwide are vulnerable uh, for all the reasons that we established in the curling case and that you heard quote from Judge Tuttenberg. Second, in Georgia, they're worse because Georgia specifically, this is another long story that I can't get into, but I'll answer questions about it. Georgia left their system, we say, left it out in the rain for a year, is what I say. But they left it exposed to the open Internet uh, from before the 2016 election until after, even though they were warned in the meantime by Logan Lamb that that was the case. So, so you have background vulnerability, even worse in Georgia. Third, you have anecdotal evidence in the 28th election of vote flipping, all these weird things happening, the tenor governor's rates not even appearing um, in different places. And then you have this, and then finally you have this aberrant vote total that I, that I described. And so you put that all into it, and what we argued was under state law that ca that casts enough doubt on the election to cause a new election. Worse still, uh, if you get to the precinct level, the the aberrant voting total shows that it had a disparate impact upon precincts with a majority African-American population. You put all this together and we rolled it up and did not convince the trial court. Uh, 
and um, we're on appeal to the Georgia Supreme Court. So you can, you can see the difficulties in litigating some of these cases, even with some compelling facts. The problems there was the judge started off with the presumption that this was safe, that these systems are safe. Prove me otherwise. Prove to me otherwise. We didn't get discovery of these machines, which we hope to get in the federal court case. But prove to me that these machines are unsafe. You can't look at the machines. Two, okay, you lose, and, and then we lost. So our appeal to the Georgia Supreme Court is to say you can't require, you can't not allow us discovery and then throw us out of court for not proving what, what only discovery would provide. So that's the basis of our Georgia Supreme Court uh, appeal, which is currently ongoing. Um, so to sum things up, um, in terms of sort of the, the success, the keys to success, I guess, in, in these cases, um, it's the, the ground level work is, is extremely important uh, in these cases. Um, the Martin case was successful, I believe, in large part because the coalition, working very closely with uh, the Lawyers Committee, found actual voters whose absentee votes had been rejected. And we added them as named people, three actual people, and we told their stories. You know, so-and-so was a 70-year-old immigrant, tried to vote, his absentee vote was rejected. He went back into the county. It was rejected again. This sort of very human story that, took, that I think was very persuasive, and, and I think it really helped us win. Uh, other examples is the, <clears throat> is the precinct level research uh, that, that the coalition's uh, people did uh, on, the, uh, on the undervote case. Was, uh, well, I think it will be very uh, instructive. Um, the other thing I think is obvious is that um, with election cases, a lot of the work has to be done in the off season uh, because it's like reseeding the baseball. In if you wait too late, it's like reseeding the infield, baseball infield during the season. You can't do it. Too many people running around, too many things happening. It just doesn't work. So you have to do a lot of work uh, in the time, which is now, when you're not having a big election right, out, right around the corner. So now's the time to be, to be you know, raising money, to be litigating, and to be filing suit if you need to. Um, the other thing is what I mentioned before is, and this I think is going to happen because I'm optimistic, um, is that the, is convincing um, everyone, not just politicians, but judges, everybody, that these systems are inherently vulnerable. Uh, and to start with that so that you don't have to prove that they are, but they have to prove that they're not. And I think that given the states have made the decision, or Georgia has made the decision, to deploy an unaudible, unauditable voting system, they're unable to remove the doubt. That's their problem, not ours. And so the burden ought to shift. Uh, and the more judges understand that, the more they will instinctively, through their decisions, actually affect a, a changing of, of the presumption and changing of the burden of proof. Thanks. But okay, I'm a little bit shorter, obviously. Uh, um, I, uh, I want to start by thanking the conference organizers as well, my colleague Liz Howard, um, as well as Candace, Larry, and Bruce. Uh, this is my first uh, EVN conference. I'm really excited to be here and to have the chance to speak with all of you uh, about the case we're bringing in Georgia. Uh, before I turn to the details of my case, I, I just want to quickly note that the Brennan Center has long been convening, collaborating with, and relying on the expertise of technologists and security experts like many of you in this room, and been doing so for, for many years. Uh, and your research and expertise is critical to our work, whether it's the reports we write, the policies we advocate for, or the litigation we bring, and that's certainly been the case uh, in our Georgia litigation. Um, so turning that way, uh, in the days leading up to last year's election, then Secretary of State Brian Kemp released a series of statements claiming that the state Democratic Party had tried to hack the state's voter registration system. Uh, these statements heightened publicity around already existing vulnerabilities in the state's registration systems and, in our view, heightening the risk of malicious intrusion into those systems and the resulting risk of harm to Georgia voters. Um, so my clients at Common Cause, my colleagues at the Brennan Center and I, and our partners at the law firm Paul Weiss jumped into action. I want to take a minute to give a shout out to Susanna Goodman if she's here, uh, who has 
uh, worked very closely with me, or I've worked very closely with her over the past several months, and it's been uh, pretty exciting. Um, so we rushed to get a complaint on file prior to Election Day and got it filed around 10 p.m. Uh, the evening before the election. Um, at the core of our legal claim was basically that the vulnerability of the registration system uh, as exacerbated by then Secretary of State Kemp's statements um, and combined with the state's rules for counting provisional ballots resulted in qualified, properly registered voters being disenfranchised and therefore violated a variety of state and federal laws. Um, we also included in our complaint a direction uh, to look at the use of provisional ballots in the Tuesday election. Um, our relief was premised in part on a statistically significant increase in the use of provisional ballots in 2018 as compared to relevant previous elections, and that would indicate that more people showed up uh, thinking they were registered to vote, uh, thinking they were in the right place, uh, and were told they weren't in the system or were at the wrong polling place in the wrong county. Um, and in combination with our other allegations about the vulnerability of the system, this would evidence manipulation of the registration list. So uh, that was Monday. Tuesday was Election Day. Um, on November 7th, the day after the election, we filed a motion for a temporary restraining order, or TRO. And in the world of emergency legal relief, a TRO is kind of the emergenciest legal relief you can get. Uh, you're essentially asking the court to act immediately to avoid imminent harm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, then to recap, filed our complaint late Monday, election day, pulled it together, our TRO motion on Wednesday, and then we waited for the court to act on our motion. Um, and we didn't have to wait long. So the same day we filed our TRO motion, the court set a hearing for the next day in Atlanta at 2 p.m. So a couple of my colleagues, including my boss, Myrna Perez, quickly had to, you know, figure out what flights would get them from New York to Atlanta in time to make the hearing. The court then issued another order directing us to either produce witnesses in person or file affidavits with testimony supporting the factual allegations we made in our complaint and in our motion. The next morning, the, mor the morning of the hearing, brought more orders. The defendant was ordered to be prepared to discuss the use of provisional ballots in 2018 and how it compared to previous elections. And we were directed to produce uh, testimony supporting common causes Georgia's standing to bring the case, and standing has been alluded to. Previously, it's, uh, I would say, very simply and eliding a lot of complications, but is a legal prerequisite for invoking the power of a federal court. Uh, and you basically need to establish that you've suffered some harm at the hands of the defendant. Um, and so in all, by a quick count I did last night, we filed nine separate affidavits from both fact witnesses and, voter, and experts prior to the hearing that afternoon. Um, the court then held an hours-long motion, on, uh, hours-long hearing on our motion, taking testimony from the state's election director and chief information officer, and hearing extensive argument from the lawyers. And at the end of the hearing, she issued another order asking us to file an additional written submission on the standing issue. The next day, more orders. We were directed to submit an affidavit from a qualified statistician analyzing the provisional data the state eventually provided, and his analysis demonstrated that there was a statistically significant increase in the use of provisional ballots in 2018 as compared to the most relevant election uh, in 2014, since they're both midterm elections. Um, and we continued to submit additional testimony from fact witnesses and experts supporting our allegations. So that was a bit of a blow-by-blow -blow account of like a, a few days in my life, but uh, I hope it wasn't too boring. I, I, I sort of want to give you a little insight into the kind of power and perils of these types of lawsuits, lawsuits seeking this type of urgent uh, emergency relief. Um, as has also been alluded to, generally the American legal system is not known for its speed, um, but in the lead-up to an election, courts have the power and the capability to prevent imminent and unexpected harm to voters, particularly when the re relief sought can reasonably be implemented quickly. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, uh, probably better than I do, a wide variety of unexpected issues can arise in advance of elections. Um, and here are just some of the cases outside of Georgia uh, that were filed in the month before last year's election. In Florida and South Carolina, lawsuits were filed seeking extensions of the voter registration deadline in response to Hurricane Michael and Hurricane Florence, respectively. In Kansas, a suit was filed challenging the relocation of Dodge City's sole polling location. In North Dakota, a challenge was filed to the state's voter ID law. In Tennessee, a challenge was filed to 
a county's rejection of many, many voter registration applications. And in Texas, uh, a lawsuit challenged a county's alleged refusal to provide students at a historically black university with equal early voting opportunities to other people in the county. So that's all to say the types of situations that arise in advance of elections are highly varied, and litigation is often the only way to obtain a change in practice prior to the election. Um, so uh, lawyers and judges obviously are not uh, you know, network security experts, or at least are not required to be. Um, and understanding and explaining the details of these security issues in particular can be difficult. But I think if you look at the variety of cases that courts have to deal with, um, they're used to dealing with novel and complex issues on a highly expedited basis. Uh, so. Um, you, you know, they can deal with understanding these issues quickly if you give them the right information. Um, but it's obviously difficult for both the litigants and the court. Uh, from the litigants' perspective, you have to generate very quickly sufficient information for the court to make an informed decision or what, on what are often very complex issues. Um, and on that point, I'll note that our case was designated by the court when we filed it as related to the curling case. Um, so we went to the same judge that has that case, and she was already well-versed in some of the complicated security issues that our case presented. Um, there are just a couple of other takeaways that I wanted to flag before I wrap up. Uh, first, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, registration systems nationwide are continue to be inviting targets for our adversaries. Last year, the Senate Intelligence Committee reported that in 2016, Russian agents targeted at least 18 states' election systems, and in a small number uh, were able to gain access that put them in a position to alter or delete voter registration data. Um, in a report my colleagues Larry Norden and Ian Vandewalker authored in 2017, they estimated that at that time 41 states were then using voter registration databases that had initially been created over a decade prior. And I should say that number is probably somewhat out of date at this point, but I just raise it uh, to get sort of a sense of the scope of the issue here. Um, and the second takeaway is that provisional ballots are a critical fail-safe in elections, but only if they're counted properly. So in particular, in a situation in which the registration system has been breached, determining a provisional voter's eligibility by reference to the breached registration system alone is inadequate. Um, and election officials need to broaden the sources of registration data that they're reviewing and should also take seriously a voter's sworn statement of eligibility th that they submit to, to obtain an, uh, a provisional ballot. So in conclusion, our case is continuing. Uh, we obtained relief um, on November 12th, um, but uh, our, our case is sort of ongoing. Um, the state answered our complaint last year, and we have proceeded to discovery. So we're in the midst of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before we move forward into questions, I'd like to, uh, to introduce you to Leslie Bryan. Leslie, could you come up here, please? Um, Leslie is one of the attorneys representing uh, uh, Stacey Abrams' Fair Fight organization in Georgia in uh, additional Georgia litigation. I invited her to say a, a, a few words about that. I wanted her to get to know all of you. She's new to us, but she has a very important case in Georgia as well. Thank you, Candace. Thank you all very much. I, I very much appreciate Candace inviting me to join you. This is very informative to us because as a lawyer, it's not that difficult to figure out that uh, closing precincts in minority areas of the city of Atlanta has a disparate impact on minority voters. What's more difficult for us as lawyers is to figure out how the cybersecurity element of voting also has a disparate impact on voters. So that's one of the things that we're interested in pursuing in this case. Um, you're now hearing about the fifth case pending in Georgia stemming from the conduct of the election. In our case, and we, we said it was also a related case we did not get before Judge Totenberg. Um, and I feel a particular affection to Judge Totenberg. She was my, one of my husband's first law partners. So I think she's a fabulous judge and you're very fortunate to have her. We also have a very good judge. So we're looking forward to litigating before him. We have recently filed an amended complaint, and if anybody wants a copy, just let me know. I'm happy to send it to you. But in our amended complaint, we now represent six organizations, including Fair Fight, which is the 
a Stacy-related organization that succeeds to Voter Access Institute. But among other things, we represent the Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so as a lawyer, um, I think it's an extremely proud moment to be able to stand up in court and say that I'm appearing on behalf of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Because if you're trying to secure minority voter rights, what better way to do it than to represent the Ebenezer Baptist Church? And they and all of our clients have been incredibly helpful in this case. My theory about what happened in Georgia is that there was a concerted effort to suppress progressive voters because we saw in my precinct, which is not a minority precinct, but is filled with progressive voters, we saw long lines, fewer voting machines, and a real effort to keep people, discourage people from voting. What happened in minority districts is even more telling, and as Bruce talked about, when you look at these numbers from the lieutenant governor's race, they're stark. And Marilyn actually sat down in our conference room and explained to me what had happened and showed me my precinct, and we had an unexpectedly large drop-off, but it was nothing compared to the drop-off that you saw in minority precincts in Fulton County, which is predominantly the city of Atlanta. So in any event, in the Fair Fight case, we are pursuing claims for violations of the Voting Rights Act, for violations of the 14th Amendment, for violations of the Help America Vote Act, uh, for due process violations, and we are seeking to change the way that Georgia votes, from whether it's how they treat your application for an absentee ballot to how at the end of the day they deal with your provisional ballot. We are seeking to effect a change. And as I said at the outset, we understand how to do that with respect to the disparate impact that voting uh, irregularities may have on minority populations. But the security piece is a, a relatively new piece when you start thinking about disparate impact on minority voters. Um, we've detailed in our amended complaint some of the issues that minority and, racial and uh, ethnically minority voters encountered. One of the stories, there are two stories that I think are particularly telling about what was going on, and these stories are replicated throughout. In one of the stories, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, who holds a chaired professorship at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory, has a hyphenated last name. His last name is Del hyphen Rio. So that's what his voter registration says, Del hyphen Rio. But the Georgia Driver's License Bureau doesn't have the ability to put in a hyphen. And for many women in this room, you may appreciate the difficulty of being Smith hyphen Jones. The Georgia Driver's License Bureau can't cope with you. And they certainly can't cope with it with any, we haven't figured out a way to say it correctly, but with sort of more non-traditional names. And so Dr. Del Rio shows up to vote and he hands in his driver's license, which has no space, no hyphen between Dell and Rio. And they say, we're very sorry, you can't, register, you can't vote. Well, Dr. Del Rio, fortunately, was an educated voter and knew how to push back and how to tell them that that was absolutely ridiculous. But in an affidavit that he gives us and he cites in his, in, that we cite in our amended complaint, he talks about the impossibility of less powerful, less enfranchised voters when they encountered the same thing. The other story that we tell, and this, this is replicated, and if you don't think there's something wrong with the voter registration system, you just, you're not seeing the data. The data says that people would show up at the polls, they've been registered at the same address for the last six years, and all of a sudden they're being told to go back and vote in some county that they haven't lived in. One of the more telling examples was a vet, and she and her husband checked two weeks before the election, and they see that they're registered to vote at 123 Main Street, and they vote at the Main, Street Baptist, uh, the Main Street Elementary School. So on election day, they go to the elementary school, and husband, sure enough, 123 Main Street, come in and vote. Her registration is now showing at some address she has never even lived in on the opposite side of the county. How did that happen? Don't know. But something happened during this election. So we hope as we proceed down this case to rectify it, and I agree, election, lawyers don't solve all problems. There's no question about that. But I will say that lawyers and judges have been at the forefront historically of affecting change, whether it was Katzenbach versus South Carolina, whether it was Westbury versus Sanders, two cases from the 1960s. Litigation has been at the forefront of ensuring that minority votes are counted, minority votes are tallied, and we hope to be continuing that tradition here and so my question, <laughs> if I get to ask a question after that rather long-winded introduction, is I'd like you to talk a bit about disparate impact and cybersecurity.
and how you see that playing out. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to start? And first describe what disparate impact as a legal theory means or what, what's of concern. Sure. Um, that, yeah, and I, you know, I don't know if this is. Yeah, it's on. Um, I don't know. Um, so the question in a way is sort of close to my heart. What my um, sort of upbringing as a lawyer, the, the place that I um, spent a bunch of years sort of learned to be a lawyer was in the ACLU's um, national office and mainly worked in the, the racial justice program there. So we thought a lot about disparate impact impact, uh, disparate impact doctrine um, and how to how to make that apply in a broad set of areas. So so generally that. Do we have a techie on, on the mic? How about now? Okay. I can give a more concise version of that wind up now. So um, I appreciate the question. I come to this uh, with a background as a civil rights lawyer. Um, and so I, I think it's a great question for all of us to be thinking about. Um, disparate impact refers to a set of legal doctrines that allow plaintiffs to bring and to prevail on discrimination cases even when they're not able to produce kind of smoking gun evidence of discriminatory intent. There are, you know, without getting deep in the weeds, there are um, a set of areas of the law where to win on a discrimination case, you need to produce that kind of smoking gun evidence and that creates quite significant obstacles uh, for people who have been victims of, of very real discrimination. So disparate impact doctrine very quickly descends then into a kind of technical set of questions about who has the burden to show what at different times. So without getting into that, um, you know, I think it's a great question in this, um, on this set of topics. And I would love to be sort of brainstorming with, um, with this whole group about that. You know, my sense is that as with many areas of anti-discrimination law, the you know, the, sort of the devil is in the data, and one of the questions is how we get and maintain better data. Um, so, you know, if you ask me for my intuition, particularly on things like paperless DRE machines, right, like this is voting equipment that doesn't work that well. It doesn't serve voters as well as other alternatives, right? So historically, uh, our um, deficient public goods equitably distributed in our country? No, they're not equitably distributed. Um, they're, you know, historically and particularly in the voting context, distributed in a disparate and discriminatory way. Um, what I don't think we have that exists in some other areas of discrimination law is systematic data to sort of get at that. So, you know, I think hearing about the uh, the Georgia case, the lieutenant governor's case, is, is a great example of a way to be innovative in, in trying to excavate that data and then develop legal claims around it. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that's um, a frontier in this area that people should be thinking about and I, I would love to be thinking about along with other folks. If, if I could jump in to just to, to add a little piece. Um, uh, the disparate impact versus uh, disparate treatment are the two major approaches to uh, litigating discrimination. Uh, Disparate treatment, I know it's an un unwieldy term, but it really refers to intent-based um, and having proof of intent to discriminate. We have a whole nother area, the disparate impact area, where we can rely on data to show, well, if we have sort of, you know, the white precincts have um, a uh, three voting machines for every voter uh, sort of support, and we have over here for the minority precincts proof that there is one voting machine for, or, for every thousand voters, then a presumption of, you don't even have to say intent, but we have um, a kind of proof, that rebuttable proof, that there is discrimination. So part of what Leslie's asking and what we need to be thinking about is, you know, in the election cybersecurity area, are the machines or the um, the infrastructure for minority voting locations or the apparatus that they use in those, and particularly minority-dominated counties, are they more poorly funded or do they have uh, fewer protections so that their votes are more vulnerable? And I don't think our community as a group has looked at this at all yet. So it's a very important set of issues, and I thank you for raising them, Leslie. And um, so let's turn it over for any other questions. Um, first, um, 
in the back, Duncan, and then we'll go to Ron and Matt. I've been, I tried for several years to think, not a lawyer, how to write this in law. I thought the document that was submitted was absolutely brilliant. If you're interested in Frank Heindel's FOIA, the documents, he has twice torn up the check that I tried to write to him to reimburse him. He's put in, I think, more than $5,000 to get FOIA documents. Most of them are up on my website. If you want to look at uh, human uh, uh, Homeland Security reports, redacted, they're up on my website. If you want to look at the National Guard reports, they're up on my website. Some of the redactions are done so cleverly that if you know how to lift the black off a PDF, you can see what's underneath. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ron? Duncan, I'll make the transfer of funds that we discussed uh, right after this. Is this on? Yes, good. So I remember reading uh, about the introduction of the Australian paper ballot in the late 1800s uh, and then remembering the ballot being criticized for being a literacy test in effect. So it had a, a disparate impact or something like that at the time. Is there any litigation from that period? Is that case actually a parallel one to what happened, what's happening now, or is, am I missing some legal niceties? Um, over here. Uh, two ladies over here. Introduce so good afternoon. I am Michelle Williams, the Director of Research with the EAC, and I guess my question is just for clarification. Uh, when you mention data, what data are you referring to to come to the emerging trends that you speak of? So you know, what I had in mind was, for example, data, you know, systematic data around the country on um, who is affected by um, the placement, you know, particularly, for example, in states that use DRE machines in some counties <laughs> and not others, right? Which voters are um, using, for example, DRE machines versus other machines? Um, which voters are impacted by systemic failure of those machines, right? So again, you know, thinking about South Carolina, work that Duncan has done along with, with, um, with our client, 